Backyard Farmer is a co-production of NET Television and Nebraska Extension. Tonight on Backyard Farmer, we'll help you prevent your potatoes from rotting and we'll get your peach trees pruned up for the spring. That's all coming up next, right here on Backyard Farmer. Farmer. I'm Kim Todd and I'll be your host for the next hour of Good Gardening. Joining me on the panel tonight, we have experts from Nebraska Extension. We have Tom Weisling answering our insect questions. Good evening. Rot Gaswa, all of those turf and weed questions. Great to be here, Kim. Kevin Corris, Rots and Spots. Howdy ho. And making her debut appearance this season, Kelly Feehan is going to answer our horticulture questions. Hello, everyone. You know, since this is a pre-recorded program, we can't take your calls tonight, but you can still send us an email or a picture for a future show. That address is byf at unl.edu. Remember when you send us those emails to give us as much information as you can, including where you live, that really makes a difference in us giving you the right answer. Don't forget to like us on Facebook, follow our tweets on Twitter, as well as our video features on YouTube. And before we get to questions, let's take a look at a few samples. And Tom, we've been getting an awful lot of calls about this one over the season already. This is rough bullocal off of my bur oak at home. Mm -hmm. And it seems to be completely covered with them. And I, it, it, galls are really neat insects because they actually feed on the plant and the plant grows around them. And that means they're protected. So it's really hard to spray them and it's really hard for predators and parasitoids to get to them. So this plant last fall, a little tiny wasp came out called a sinipid wasp, and she laid her eggs in some of the dormant buds. Now this spring, these little larvae will hatch and they'll start to grow or feed on the plant, the plant will grow around them, and then you'll get these little galls being formed. And of course, they're green during the summer. And if you take a look at these galls, some of them have holes in them, some of them don't. That's where the wasp had chewed her way out. Uh, this, the ones with the holes, the wasp chewed her way out. So other ones didn't have holes in them. I'm assuming that they may have been parasitized or uh, they had died during the feeding process. If, if they had, uh, if they're parasitized, let this go, parasites will emerge and they can actually do a pretty good job of controlling the insect. Now, typically we say don't do much in the way of control. Uh, I do none. Actually, what I actually like to do is just uh, prune off parts that are heavily infested, or you can break off some of the some of the uh, larger galls. All right. So not any insecticides anyway that are going to get into that nice gally thing. Not at all. All right. Okay, Rock, our favorite spring flower in the lawn. Well, I'm falling apart here, <laughs> <laughs> and that's not just the flower. Um, so this is dandelion. I think everyone knows what dandelion looks like. It's in the yards right now. It's really flowering prolifically. Um, it's too late to treat this, this spring. And actually we recommend fall treatments as most of you know, but you can get it relatively, you can get pretty good knockdown early in the spring. The trouble is when you get to this time of the year, you're gonna get horrible control. Plus you're knocking out these flowers, which are uh, really nice for the pollinators, as Thank Tom you. would say. And so, that, um, no, no question. So, you know, if you don't mow a little bit and they shoot that, a bolt up. It's a great place for the bees to light and have some fun with and other pollinators as well. So let's just leave them alone. Let them be and uh, they'll be fine and then catch them in the fall long before they flower and we don't really have uh, any issues with the bees being around as long and the plant actually gets controlled better. And those little kids can do the do I love butter or not <laughs> under their chin. Maybe in your neighborhood. <laughs> okay, Kevin, Whoa. that is really ugly. What is that? Uh, I have a turf sample here. This is a creeping bent grass turf, and it has gray snow mold, and you can clearly see how there's kind of a circular pattern of gray there. Um, and that is actually the fungal mycelium. Um, so this is a fungal disease of turf grass caused by a fungus called Typhula. Um, and it affects um, most cool season turf grasses. Um, so you get this ring pattern in um, turf grasses that are kept at a really low mowing height. So you typically see this in a golf course fairway or a golf course green. Now you can get snow molds to occur in the home um, lawn <clears throat> as well on, on turf grass that's maintained at a little bit higher uh, of, of a mowing height, but it won't um, typically show up as these circular patterns. Um, it'll be just kind of more of a blotch out in your lawn. 
is what you'll see. And as the name implies, this is a snow mold fungus. So um, this particular disease is favored by snow cover. Um, so when you have snow on your lawn, although you don't have to have snow cover to get this disease, if you have periods of cool, wet, cloudy um, weather, you can get snow molds to occur in the lawn. So um, most of our cool season turf grasses are susceptible, so resistance isn't a thing, unfortunately, for this particular disease. We can't battle it that way. What you need to do is just manage your snow cover by either putting a snow fence to help block the snow from landing on an area of turf grass that might be affected, or by trying to expose that lawn to some more sunlight, if you can, by maybe pr pruning the canopy if you have trees above your lawn, to increase the sunlight to help melt that snow and keep, um, keep the snow cover off that lawn and help prevent this particular fungus from occurring. Um, in, in golf courses, uh, typically there are um, fungicides that they use and it's a pretty heavy regiment of fungicides that are preventative, so they're applied usually um, in between the Thanksgiving and, and Christmas um, holidays, usually November, December-ish. But in the home landscape, we just recommend um, managing your snow load and you shouldn't see this guy pop up. Excellent. Thank you, Kevin. All right, Kelly. Last week, Elizabeth had some little tomato plants, and you've got a... I have a large tomato transplant. So large, I have to support it to hold it up. And as people are buying their transplants, I brought this in just to kind of remind people that bigger is not better when it comes to buying transplants. Um, smaller is actually better. I think some people have the idea that if I start with a larger plant that I will, um, you know, I'll get yields sooner and I'll be able to harvest sooner. But it often goes the opposite direction. Uh, there's a little bit more transplant shock, so that can set the plant back. Um, and it can reduce yields as well, especially in tomatoes. And, you know, right now we're probably planting more of the coal crops like uh, broccoli and cauliflower, cabbage. And in, in those crops, if you start with too large a transplant, so a lot of times it will cause them to bolt and they'll go to seed too early. So again, you'll reduce your yields. And the other one that we, uh, the cucurbits are another one, like cucumbers, for example, and muskmelon. Those are another ones we can buy transplants of. And those transplants should really be small, only about, they're only supposed to be about three weeks old. So those are going to be even smaller than, say, a cauliflower transplant that's usually six weeks old. So just remember, bigger is not better. It's okay to buy those little small ones like Elizabeth had last week. All right, thanks, Kelly. <clears throat> okay, Tom, you get the first picture. Yay. And this is from a viewer in Sutherland. And uh, they sent a picture, uh, this is the, the picture they sent of this tree covered with these creepy gray insects. Creepy? <laughs> well, they're pretty creepy. Oh, Kim. What are they? Creepy. That's not the word we, we use to describe the insects. Well, they're creeping. Um, yes, that's true. They are crawling. And I'm, I'm guessing that this picture was not taken this spring. I see quite a bit of foliage on there and it seems a little bit early for these aphids to be active. They are aphids. They are giant bark aphids that they can attack a wide variety of plants, uh, different trees, or could be a giant willow aphid. I can't quite tell from, from the picture, but they, they both get to be about a quarter inch in length. So, they're so they said size. those are willows, actually. They're globe willows. So. They are probably, yeah. there's a likely that they could be um, giant willow aphids. Basically, this time of year, if, when they start to emerge, um, is really the time to try to do some sort of control. I'd recommend just taking a nice stream of water out there, not too strong to strip the bark off the tree, but enough to dislodge the aphids. So when you see them uh, later on in the season, later in the summer, it's just not worth doing that type of uh, effort to control them. And how big are they? Up to a quarter inch. Wow. Not including the legs. That is big for an aphid. Yes. All right. Rock. Um, so speaking of dandelions and timing. This particular viewer saw this in their neighborhood, dandelion death and clover life, like right next to it. And they're wondering what the person probably used that would have killed the dandelions, not touched the clover, and what was it in terms of having any effect on the surrounding landscape? And those are legitimate questions. I'm gonna say that they probably hit the dandelions earlier than the clover emerge. Um, the dandelions come up much, we see them a lot earlier than we see the clover, or that they used strictly a 2,4-D based product because 2,4-D doesn't injure um, clover and it does, it will curl up and make that uh, ugly appearance of the dandelions. Now the question is, is, is it going to carry over into the garden? We're not even sure if it's, um, 
it, you know, which herbicide it is. So before we start making these far-reaching things, oh yeah, it's going to damage the garden. I'm going to say it probably didn't, uh, even 2,4-D. Th those don't look like they were severely injured to me, so it's probably a little bit low rate as, or, or maybe just a minimal amount of rate. And then the third question is, is you know, they didn't ask it, but, you know, could, could this have been drift? And I'm going to say since the clover didn't show any injury whatsoever, that was probably a timing issue. All right. Thanks, Rock. <clears throat> Kevin, this is a viewer in Burwell. And she says, in their lawn, new turf in the summer of 2013, she tripped over this thing. Um, green, mossy-looking center, about three inches in diameter. Looks root-like, tuber-like. Looks like wood, but there is, was no wood where this was unless some ancient portion of tree root was just below the surface. They wonder if it's, and she's, she thinks it's an alien growth. She just doesn't <laughs> want any more of them. What do you think it is? Well, I think she's right. It could be an alien. Um, <laughs> no, I, um, to be honest, I, I don't know exactly what that is. It does look to be fungal. It's really difficult to tell from that picture. But the fact that they have a relatively new lawn, and when they were putting that lawn down, they didn't see any, anything, any logs or any chunks of wood, um, makes me think, and, and how the, it's emerging out of the grass, you know, he tripped over it. Um, it makes me think that it is indeed some kind of a fungal structure. It's interesting that he says that it's, uh, it was hard like wood, because um, typically those fungal structures that form aren't really that solid. You should be able to cut right through them with a, with a spade. Um, so that's not an excellent answer from me. I think it's a fungus. I would just um, you know, pull it out of the landscape and, and hopefully you won't see any more emerging. Um, Kevin, can I comment please, on that perhaps? Please do. So new construction, new house. Uh, frost heaving of lumber from construction site, and then it would get fungal growth in and around it. Then it would be, you know, two by four is kind of woody. That just what well, I'm not mm -hmm. a pathologist, but I'm just saying. Sure. <laughs> so the, the wood would actually heave up out of the ground because For, of frost. We had, a, you know, when you look at our highways and stuff and our roads, they we had a lot, a lot of frost heaving last year. Hmm. Interesting. So it'd be really fun if they'd actually bring us a piece. Yes. Yeah. Always submit a sample if. <laughs> You have the time. But, okay. not, but not if you're, it's going to prove me wrong. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Kelly. Uh, we have a viewer who sent in a picture of a spruce that is seven years old. Um, it was a little seedling, and it's got these little brown things. He's thinking that it should have some new growth already and wonders what the brown things are. Okay, well, the little brown things are buds. Um, they're natural. They're normal. They should be there. Looks like a very healthy spruce. And it's really just a little bit too early for that new growth yet. It's typically sometime in May before we see new growth on, on most of our evergreens and, and on spruce especially. So I just be, it looks very healthy. Keep doing whatever you're doing and be a little bit patient. You should see some new growth here soon. All right. Thanks, Kelly. Well, it's a shame when you put in all that hard work to get potatoes planted, grown, and harvested, only to have them rot in storage. While we can't offer a solution that will prevent every single rot, Amy Timmerman is here to help us with some tips to avoid your potatoes going to waste after you dig them up. hardest things we have to deal with is after we've harvested those beautiful potatoes after all season, we put them into storage and we go pull out those potatoes to make our favorite baked potato, twice baked potato, whatever potato dish, and we come into those rots and spots. And probably the number one disease that we see with storage potatoes is Fusarium dry rot. Now that disease and the symptoms that we see on the tubers vary from variety of variety, but also where it's actually at in development. So a lot of times we see symptoms such as a sunken in area in the tuber. It could be on the side, it could be on either end of the potato. It could be very superficial. Otherwise it can go all the way in like this potato where it's actually gone inside the entire potato and it's pretty much ate the whole thing out. An easy way to identify Fusarium dry rot is really the texture of the potato. Um, the, one of the main characteristics when you read about it says it's dry. And if you feel the tuber itself, it is very dry in texture, kind of flaky actually in overall appearance. And that's because of the fungus eats away at the, uh, the starches of the potato. We can also see the mycelia, or that white fuzzy growth that we see growing with it, as we can see on this tuber. And it can be a variety of colors from yellows to pinks to whites because it likes a lot of humidity and it'll start to grow. 
But the big thing is once we actually cut open that potato, and we can see a lot of variations from where we have an indention here, we have some white fuzzy stuff there, and then it works its way in, we can see it's gone down into the tuber itself. Other situations, if we look at this tuber, you put it together, we see a little bit of an indention. It doesn't look too bad. It might be an area that we can cut out and still eat it. We cut the potato open and it's completely gone into the cavity of the potato. It's eaten everything out and you see that white fuzzy growth on the inside. Very typical for a fusarium. So what do we do about fusarium dry rot? <clears throat> Once we have it in our storage potatoes, there isn't anything we can really do. You're gonna pick and choose which potatoes that you can eat and cut out the bad spots whenever you can. We're gonna look at more of how are we harvesting our potatoes at the end of the season to prevent the storage. So we wanna make sure we have tubers that have cured correctly so the skins are nice and hard. And we want it to provide, prevent any damage to the tuber whenever possible. That's where this fungus comes in, wherever we have damage. And then we wanna make sure our storage facilities stay cool and we have some air circulation. And that's really the big things that we can do to prevent fusarium dry rot. We're still gonna run into a few situations from year to year. The other big trick I forgot to mention is some varieties are just a heck of a lot more susceptible than others. So if you had a bad year, maybe next year you wanna try a different variety. <clears throat> With a few of those steps, you can manage fusarium dry rot and you should have some great potatoes to eat throughout the entire season and enjoy with your family. You know, of course, you don't want to put in all that work into that potato crop just to see those rot away. So as Amy said, pick resistant varieties, avoid damaging them when they come out of the ground, and always have that good cool air circulation. When they're in storage, you'll have a good chance of avoiding that fusarium rot. And there is really nothing worse in the refrigerator or the pantry than a rotting potato smell. Bass. It's almost worse than a dead mouse. Okay, and on that note, <laughs> You get the next picture. Yay. This is so cool because we've had so many of these, but look at what's along the edges. Uh -huh. um, this is a Lincoln viewer. He thought it was a chrysalis and would turn into a beautiful moth, so he put it in a north-facing windowsill. He misted it, uh -huh. and this happened. S what is it? Surprise. Yeah. Definitely not a butterfly. <laughs> that is based on the, that is an egg mass of a Chinese Mm -hmm. And we have two types here, the Chinese or the Carolina, and those are just little hatchlings. Um, hopefully they're still doing fairly well. You would be, you could take them outside and let them go. Try to do it on a calmer day than it's been the past few days because yeah. they may just fly down to Kansas. Uh, <laughs> but they, they are actually beneficial insects, so it would be great if you can get them outside. Are they cannibals? Will they eat They each will other? eat each other. They will eat whatever they come across. So if it's it, crawling, yeah. it's going down. <laughs> <laughs> okay, are you ready, Rock? Sure. Your question, this is an Omaha viewer uh, who, who uh, apparently has an overgrown neighborhood behind them. They get many weed seeds. They've got a couple that are really prevalent in flower beds. They want to know what they should do. Pull, use chemicals, what chemicals? So the two different weeds in here from this person. Okay, the first one um, is just common lamb's quarter, and that's a common uh, row crop weed. Thank you. Um, that's a common row crop weed. We see it all over central and eastern Nebraska, even to a limited extent into the uh, western part of the state. Um, and it's in the seedling stage, and right now it'd be real easy to hand pull or to hoe a little bit or cultivate up. It, it shouldn't really be a problem, so that one would be easy to control. The other one I actually had to look up, which was um, interesting to me, but I, I believe that's pinnate tansy mustard. Now, there's a tansy mustard that is a winter annual, strictly a winter annual, and relatively common, and then there's a pennate tansy mustard, based on the way the leaves are configured, that is both a winter annual and a summer annual. So this might be one that either wintered or overwintered and will flower soon, should have a yellow flower on it, or it's something that will go through a life cycle and then when in the heat of the summer will, uh, um, excuse me, with the killing frost next year, will then um, die. So bottom line is it's either or, but it can be a winter annual or a summer annual. So I'm pretty sure that's what it is. Just to, for the viewer, if you could send us a um, picture of that when it's flowering, that would be extremely helpful. And then we can maybe find out that there was, it was something totally different than what I thought. Based on the, the sample and the, and, the, and the picture and how close you got to it, I'm pretty confident it's pinnate tansy mustard. Cool. And it's kind of a good year for weeds already. It's a very good year for weeds. All right. Uh, Kevin, it's turf disease night. 
Um, this is a viewer who sent in a picture of white stuff on the blades of their grass already. Mm -hmm. What is that and what do they do about it? Yeah, it looks like, um, to me it looks like powdery mildew and powdery mildew is a fungal disease um, that is favored by um, kind of cooler, uh, humid conditions and shady conditions as well. So you'll get it in the turf grass, typically on Kentucky bluegrass, but there are other, um, there are other turf grass species that are hosts for, for that particular fungal pathogen. Um, what you want to do is basically, if you can, increase the exposure to both the wind and the sun in that area, and you should gain pretty good control just by doing that. Um, if you keep getting um, powdery mildew year after year and you can't gain sufficient control just by um, those cultural practices, uh, there are some fungicides available. Uh, propiconazole type of a product would work um, good in controlling powdery mildew in the turf grass. But um, first try to improve the drainage of your soil and expose that particular turf grass area to more sun and wind. Is it early to be seeing powdery mildew in turf? Um, we had those 90 degree, that, or, the, or that That's 80 degree days. That's probably what yeah. Yeah, you, yeah, you could probably popped. see it show yeah. up yeah. already. Well, it apparently is. they did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Kelly, this is an Omaha viewer. They have a seven year old red maple in the front yard. Um, sun scald about four years ago. They have been wrapping the trunk. They're saying it does leaf out just fine, but will it succumb? They want to know should they remove the tree and replace it with something else um, or what? Okay, well, it'd be nice if we could see into the future and, and say whether it'll die in, you know, five years, 10 years, or, or live for 30 years. <coughs> um, really, what it comes down to is kind of weighing the pros and cons. And probably the pros here is that the tree does look um, quite healthy. And as long as it is leafing out well each year and you're, you know, you're not getting dead branches, dead branch tips, maybe look at the length of the new growth. If it's on, on a red maple that age, it should be at least a foot long, maybe even longer if it's really, uh, you know, vigorous growing and doing well. Uh, the, other th the other pro here is if you look at that closely, you, you do get that nice callus growth. It looks like that wound is closing over. And if the tree is otherwise healthy, it should have compartmentalized. You know, this, that callus growth hopefully is a good indication that it's uh, compartmentalizing. And that's when trees send a chemical defense to a wound like that and it kind of uh, compartmentalizes it off so that any decay, it, it might look dead and look d diseased or even decayed. But the, if the tree's done what it needs to do and it's healthy, it can do that. It, it'll, that decay will not be able to go into the rest of the tree. So I guess those are kind of the pros here, and it's it's a red maple, and it's you know they're fast growing and they have beautiful fall color. The cons, um, if I have to talk about some of the cons, is the fact it's a red maple, it's fast growing, and it's very brittle wooded. Um, the other thing is that you know that is a large wound. If you if the tree gets stressed some way, then it's possible that any decay that's in there, um, that compartmentalization could be compromised and it may eventually go into the tree. You just have to monitor the tree if you decide to keep it. Um, you know, so really, I, I guess if, I, if you decide to keep it, keep wrapping it in the winter only. Um, I'm very happy to see that the, tr the wound hasn't been treated. There's right. no paint on it, there's no, so do not do that. So that's a, that's a pro too. Um, but I guess I would keep wrapping it in the winter until it hopefully completely closes over. All right. Thank you, Kelly. Well, the recent moisture we've been getting has really started to green things up. It's also helped our favorite yellow flowers, as Rock said, to pop out of the ground, too. So for this week's green and growing tip, Bill Kreuzer talks about how he would get rid of dandelions. This is the time of year when homeowners want to take care of the dandelions that are throughout their yards. They're really obvious with that familiar yellow flower and it can be unsightly for someone that wants that perfectly plush green weed free lawn. And so we look at what can we do this time of year to control dandelions. We hear all the time that the best time to control perennial weeds is during the, uh, the fall. But unfortunately, you know, we think, forget about during the fall and so now the problem here is in, in the spring, what can we do? Well, there's three different options. The first option is just try to mow really frequently and try to mow off this yellow seed head, prevent it from uh, maturing to the point that can make viable seeds. It's not a great option. Another option would be to just pull it. Um, you know, we can try to spray, but we can also be pretty effective in just trying to pop that dandelion out, try to grab that tap root and get that thing out of there and it's gone. You can spray it, maybe it'll kill it, or you can just pull it and take care of it right away. 
A lot of people don't really want to go out there and dig up those dandelions, but it is a green way of keeping them under control. And you know, you could enjoy a beverage and get a suntan and do all sorts of other good things, right? And not kill Absolutely. your tomato plants. And not your, kill your tomato yeah, plants. And not kill the so, bees. Yeah. And neighbors get some plants. exercise. So there you go. All right, uh, you get a question, Tom. This is, when should fruit tree spraying start? And is the home, home orchard spray the product to use? I guess it would depend on what you're going to be spraying for. Uh, really, if, if you're having trouble with uh, scale insects, mites, uh, maybe some uh, various hemipterans, you would actually want to use a dormant oil before bud break uh, would be one of the more common ones. Once the um, leaves are formed, and even if you have flowers, I guess I would want to see what you're spraying for before deciding what particular compound I would use or when I would spray for it. In all cases, I would recommend the least toxic material possible, most specific, and if you can get by with a, a, a horticultural oil, summer spray, or an insecticidal soap, or even neem or something like that, I would recommend that over any other product. Good, and I, w I should have said that's a viewer from Sydney, Iowa. Okay. So shout out to our Iowegians Yay, across the river. Yay, Iowa. All right, Rock, um, this is a Wood River viewer who has lindens and cannot seem to get turf to grow under them. They've tried high shade varieties, um, starts the seeds, but the turf doesn't last through the year. Even the weeds don't grow. What, what do we recommend? Well, I mean, the linden, is the linden, that's, do you think it's pretty bushy? Does it, is they, it they, heavy shade? They have shader? nice, pretty heavy shade. Okay, okay, yeah. that's yep. because, I mean, shade, plants need light to grow, most of them do, and some of them are more shade tolerant than others, mm -hmm. but I can say that a lot of the weeds aren't necessarily yellow nut sedge is an exception to that rule, and as well as henbit. Um, and turf just really doesn't like it in the dense shade, so you uh, put some mulch up against it, don't make the little uh, volcano look with the mulch, and call it good, and pull it away from the... Of the, the base of the tree to make sure water doesn't accumulate and be happy with that. I don't think you're gonna, you know, hostas look great underneath that linden. There's a lot of things. And don't be limbing up trees to, just to make more light to come in there and in general, especially some of the, the conifers. That just seems um, contrary to the way the, one a tree, the tree wants to grow. So let's leave those growing close to the ground like they should and something like a linden that's got dense shade, thanks for the ship, uh, letting me know that, uh, then uh, let's not try to grow grass under there. And you know, if you're doing something over and over again, and, and get the same result. What does Einstein say that? <laughs> Insanity. So let's, let's, a lot of people want to grow turf right up to the base of the tree, and, and even as a turf person, it's easy for me to say there's other plants or mulch that's much more appropriate. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent. All right, Kevin, so the Twitter question comes to you this week. Uh, what is wrong? Is this winter damage or disease? Mm -hmm. And this is a viewer who sent in these pictures that, uh, of use. Mm. So uh, our, our answer was at Bohica Warriors disease, no doubt and rogue it out. <laughs> what do you think? Well, uh, you know, there's, there aren't a whole lot of diseases that affect our use here in the state. There's some, some root rotters, but um, I, I haven't really seen that a lot. Ewes are evergreen, so they are susceptible to winter injury. So they're photosizing and they're using water um, all year long. And so it, it, sometimes you have to go out there and give some <coughs> supplemental water in the winter if the ground's not frozen. Also, it looked in, like, in one of those pictures like it could have been next to a sidewalk. Ewes are also very susceptible to salt damage too. So if they had gone in and salted the sidewalks in the winter and then scooped snow off of the sidewalks right next to the U, um, it could have made some pretty saline soils which are very hydrophobic. They resist water, so it could be that as well. Um, easy, to, easy to get rid of that problem, just um, kind of over irrigate with some clean water and um, you should be able to leach the salt out of the soil if that's indeed what happened. But I, I would lean more towards winter injury or salt damage rather than disease on that one. Yeah, I think you're probably right on that one. Poor sad, poor sad you. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, Kelly, we have a viewer who has raspberries, they're golden, the gold ones, uh, invading the strawberries. So oh. we have berry world going on. Uh, six feet apart, a 10 inch deep barrier he does not want the raspberries in the strawberries. So what do we do about that one? Oh, like basically all you can do is keep continue to dig out to the ones that are invading in there. And you know, that obviously that 10 inch deep barrier is not deep enough. 
if they're crawling underneath. So you could try to go with a little bit deep, deeper barrier, barrier, maybe not a little, a lot, maybe at least a, a foot, two feet, two foot barrier and see if that will help. Um, but otherwise, as long as they're that close together, um, there's a chance that those raspberries are going to keep popping up in those strawberries and you have to dig them out. Roll them out. Roll them out. There you go. And hand them off to somebody who wants the golden ones. Right. There you go. Yep. Well, our backyard farmer garden has been going strong for over five years already. We started with an ordinary plot. We've expanded it a few times, including adding a rain chain last year. Before we go to break, we're going to hear about another area in the backyard farmer garden that will be getting bigger. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, we're growing. We're not growing vegetables or flowers right now, but we're expanding our garden. The Doctor of Plant Health students, entomology students, and agronomy and horticulture students are all working together to grow our garden. These students are actually gonna showcase vegetables, so you'll be able to see different kinds of ground cover on both tomatoes and zucchinis and see how they react to the different ground cover treatments that they're using in the garden. So this summer when you stop by the backyard farmer garden you'll be able to see three different plots and you'll have interpretive signage or explaining all of those plots and we're really looking forward to seeing what they're going to see. Not only are we growing but we're looking forward to some of that rain that's going to be coming and as soon as that rain's done, we're going to be planting our garden. So keep look, checking out the garden and see what's growing in our garden. It's time for a short break. Coming up on the show, we'll have Gladys's plant of the week and the lightning round. Stay tuned for more Backyard Farmer right after these messages. Welcome back to Backyard Farmer. We'll be getting back to your questions soon. Later on in the show, we're going to be hearing about the best way to trim and prune a peach tree for maximum fruit production. Right now, it's time for the lightning round. A minute on the clock. Start with Kelly and with Tom. Keep track and no passing. You ready, Kelly? I'm ready. This is a Sioux City viewer who wants to know whether you should plant male or female asparagus and why. Uh, male asparagus because when the female produce uh, fruit, uh, it takes energy away from the plant, so you may have lower yields. Male. Excellent. This is a Lincoln viewer who has nine peach trees, 15 feet tall, but they don't have any buds. What's up? They may be dead, but <laughs> give them a little bit of time here, probably till about the middle of May. And if you see no buds, no leafing, give up on them. Sorry. We have a question about a tree for the southwest side of the house, a little ornamental one that flowers without doing shoots from the base. Hmm, boy, there's, there's some good choices, maybe Japanese tree lilac. The ones that pop into my head do shoot up from the base. Um, maybe Ohio buckeye, but those get the hard nuts. Um, yellow horn, uh, that's a little iffy. That's good, that's good enough. Okay, <laughs> is it okay to use leaves and grass clippings around potatoes as mulch? It is, but not too deep, and keep it away from the stem. How, uh, can you grow pineapples in Nebraska? No. Indoors, as a houseplant. Okay. Excellent. Nice job. <laughs> Even though you got a little off I forgot I was on the lightning round. <laughs> Darn. <laughs> okay, Kevin, you ready? Yes. <clears throat> so, we have a viewer who has a split in a tree branch, and they're wondering, should they be concerned about disease potential in the split, and what can they do about it? Yes, there's not much they can do about it, but that is an area for canker um, infections for fungi, but you want to leave it exposed to the air and the sunlight. All right, a viewer still has decent ash and has rust on them, or did last year, and they're wondering, should, are they gonna see it again, or should they do anything? Um, they shouldn't do anything. Um, if you're gonna see it again or not, is just dependent on the weather and whether or not those spores, uh, spores blow in this year. So they might not see it, and they might, but it's usually not worth warranting any kind of a treatment. So, hunting the wild morel, is mm -hmm. it time? It is about time, yep. There was little babies out about uh, five, seven, about a week ago, so they're, they should be out. It's been a little cold in some areas, so, but um, yes, it's about time. <laughs> okay, we have a viewer who says they have canker in their rose canes all the way to the base. Should mm -hmm. they start over or what? Yeah, prune at ground level. 
Okay. Will, you have it in a lot of the canes. Okay. Will verticillium wilt in maples cause the leaves to curl, or is that something else? It certainly could. Um, you would see them curling and then eventually falling off, and you would get kind of a flagging appearance where there's no leaves in the canopy in one area. Excellent. Nice job. Ready, rock. Like uh, <coughs> microwave popcorn. <laughs> yeah. Or head cheese or whatever it is Lauren says. Lunch meat. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we have a, uh, a rather elderly woman who wants to know whether it's a good idea to buy zoysia plugs through a mail order source for her lawn. No, they'll just be invasive and it'll take forever to, to fill in. All right, is there an organic method of removing turf from a vegetable garden and they don't want to ho, ho, ho? Um, something like uh, the acetic acid product, which is 20% uh, acetic acid, not vinegar, and keep it off the plants that you desire to keep. Okay, how long can you expect a lawn uh, to last without having to tear it up and do a whole renovation? Uh, if you take care of it like we recommend, probably, uh, you know, 50, 60 years. Okay, this is a viewer who seeded uh, their lawn already in Sydney. Then it got cold and it snowed. Or did they lose the little seedlings? If probably not. I mean, I'm going to say the seedlings are pretty tolerant of very cold temperatures. Okay. Is it too late to apply a pre-merge? No. All right. Will a second application likely be required this year in most locations? Or I, I can't. I can't predict that. But I'm going to say um, that if you wait until the first week in May, which is generally when we recommend, generally you're going to get seizing lawn control out of a single application. All right. Excellent. Nice job. The bar has been set, Tom. Yes. Someday maybe yes, we're I... going to go backwards, so the poor entomologist doesn't have to suffer through these. It's okay. But... I like it. <laughs> okay. Okay, so we have, um, we have a viewer who has buzzing in a hollow tree, and they, they don't know whether it's good guys or bad guys, and what it's do you It's likely think? good guys. I think we got some bees in there, so. Just let it be, let or it be. call a bee Let guy. it be. <laughs> let it be. <laughs> if okay. you ever get a chance to see a sample, send it to us. We'll, we'll take a look. Okay. Um, is butterfly bush an okay plant? for insects or will they abandon their other food sources in favor of butterfly bush? Butterfly bush is a good addition. Uh, anytime you put in a butterfly garden, and I used to run into this in Florida, people don't expect that there would be potentially larvae on whatever they plant. So they are plants for the adults and they're plants for the larvae as well. So butterfly bush is just a nice nectar source, but not a good larval host. Alrighty. Yeah. Will those baby mantises freeze if they let them go now? Uh, no, I mean, we don't have any cold temperatures, but if you want to keep them inside for a while, go to the pet store and get some fruit flies and release them, and when they get a little bit bigger, put some crickets in with them. Okay. Is colony collapse still occurring in our bee populations? Uh, it doesn't seem to be as bad this year, but there's still some winter kill, presumably due to the CDC. Excellent. Nice job. All good questions. Hey. And Hi. we have plant of the week, Kelly. Oh, great. <coughs> so, um, I'm, somebody won, but... I think it was rock. <laughs> Maybe. It's not about You winning. all won. You all won. It's about right. giving good answers. <laughs> okay, Kelly, Audience what, do we, have for, we what do we have for plant of the week? Okay, here we have some very pretty purple flowers. Um, we have the shorter ones down here is a grape hyacinth, and that's one of our bulbs. We refer to it as a miter bulb, usually not as commonly planted, but more of, of a smaller bulb. And obviously they're blooming pretty prolifically right now. They're very fragrant if you smell them. Um, they, they'll take some shade. These will take some shade. Um, they'll spread a little bit, but very nicely, not much. Um, the foliage does disappear and die. It's kind of nice grassy foliage. And voles don't seem to like them. So if you have a vole issue, uh, maybe this is the one to go with. Um, the lavender one here, the little bit taller one, is a woodland fox, uh, Phlox divericata, which is a lower, little bit lower growing one, not the creeping phlox. Uh, and this is one that will grow in shade. Uh, and it's also one that uh, does not get flocks like our garden flocks does. So just a very pretty combination there. This likes uh, moist soil too. Oh. And that one's native and the grape hyacinth actually is not, but the fragrance, mm -hmm. if our viewers yeah. could smell it, yes. they would, they would the love it. Woodland fox is very fragrant as well. Yeah, excellent. All right, thanks Kelly. All right, so you get another picture, Tom. Yes. And this is a viewer who sent us one and it wasn't really clear and then he sent us this other one and he's wondering if it's um, antlions 
next to the foundation under the eaves, and then after he watered, he says these little divity things went away. Do you th what is that, do you think? Those are ant lions, definitely. Mm -hmm. And they are actually, uh, they'll, they'll reform. They're just, I, I think it's a little bit cool right now for them to get going uh, very strong. I'm assuming it was this spring. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just yeah, a couple weeks in, ago. And spring's having a failure to launch right now. So uh, <laughs> hopefully they'll get a little bit more active. But antlions are actually neat little predatory insects. If you saw one, it looks like an alien from some sort of uh, science fiction movie. They are really horrific looking. Uh, but they do have these really neat mandibles that kind of curve around and they have little grooves in them called blood grooves So it gives you an idea of how really cool they are So a little ant or another insect gets in that falls into the cone and it tries to escape And they take little pebbles in their mandibles and throw it up and try to cause little avalanches So it comes back down so world of insects is phenomenal So we should actually get that on like GoPro or something Oh yeah that'd But you didn't great. say creepy you said something else kind of horrific really? Horrific yeah they're that horrific. animal just said horrific. horrific looking up close if you were tiny Oh no they're really cool we're, we're bigger than they are, so they're really awesome. <laughs> all right, gentlemen. <laughs> so, uh, Rock, this is a viewer who moved into a new home in December. We don't know what city, but it was a model home. They did some landscape. Um, leaves were gone. Evergreens look good. That's a whole different ball game than what they're seeing here, which is these kind of oddball little pieces of turf that are dead, and then those white clumpy wads of soil and since this is international year of soil what do we have going on at this model home i'm going to start off i think they did a, a irrigation pipe repair or maybe they fixed a head right there and you know that's a cube cut that we usually do when we're digging up a head and and they made a done, may have done it late in the year and it didn't get compacted very well or they did it too early in the year um and uh, when they were stringing pipe or a new head or whatever and so i think that just winter killed right in that location um, or they didn't put the sod back on it and it'll just it'll either grow back in from the sides if it's bluegrass or they might need to throw a little bit of seed out the white clods I'm just confused on that one I, I don't know what that um, could be other than something that was excavated and tossed up and you know that would not normally be uh, common with our soils in any part of the state with the, with that and I, I I can't really tell from that maybe maybe sending us a piece of or a clod of that and because I know Kim you said that there were others had Right. Express a similar problem, but I don't even have a good guess for that one. Right, something cloudy and weird from below. Mm. All right, it's uh, an ant lion. It's yeah, <laughs> it's a peb it's a pebble. It's from horrific. A big one. It's right. <laughs> okay, <Huge. laughs> Kevin, uh, this is an Ogallala a question, and it's uh, what what is going on with the lawn? Yeah, it's hard to say just from the picture, but it is that time of year that we would start seeing a disease called necrotic ring spot, and necrotic ring spot is a disease caused by a fungus that attacks the root system. Um, so if you look at each individual leaf blade, you probably wouldn't see any lesions on the leaf blade itself. So yeah, and if, <coughs> if you look, there's some dead leaves in there. Um, if you zoom in on that picture, um, you would notice that the, the leaves that are green don't have any, any lesions on it. So what's occurring is um, happening to the root system. And I so happen to have a, a plant sample submitted to the clinic that was um, suffering from necrotic ring spot. And if you were to go down and dig up a single plant a single little grass um, plant, what you would notice, and you can kind of see it here, um, if I can maybe, yeah. What you would notice is, yeah, the very tip there is, is really dark black colored and rotted. Um, so it's not quite showing up super well on TV here, but um, it's really, really dark colored, almost black. Um, and so that's the primary root that's been rotted away by this fungus. Um, so what to do about it. Um, aeration is, is important and you want to try to aerate the soil um, both now in the spring and later on in the fall as well. Um, in the landscape, we, we don't necessarily, in, in the home lawn, we don't necessarily recommend any um, fungicide products, but there are several available, both contact and, and or some systemic rather um, fungicides that will work down into that root system and, and help battle the fungus um, if you do have it really bad in your yard. But um, what will end up happening is that you'll get patches of, of nothing and you can get other um, grass species like annual bluegrass to go in there and, and invade those dead spots. So you want to try to reseed um, when you have a big spot like that. And reseeding, I think, would probably be best in the fall. I'll default to rock on that. But um, Yes, fall is probably better. And reseeding has a the really positive thing is that a lot of the newer cultivars are actually resistant to NRS. So um, you, you kill two birds with one stone. I just realized that if you only plant it in the circle or in that little spot, most of the new cultivars are also a lot darker green. So you have this big dark green spot and then the rest of the lawn. So if you're going to reseed, just reseed the whole lawn. 
Excellent, and I see you have a NEB guide so people can actually go online and get the NEB guide. That's true. Awesome. All right, Kelly, you get uh, a question. Uh, we don't know where this viewer is, but they have a Japanese tree lilac, and our viewers can probably see the center stump. So the leader broke out of it, and then their, their question is whether they can retrain one of those side shoots into a new leader. Okay. Yes, it has lost its central leader. And first, I may, might, might say you might want to go out and prune out what's left of that stub because we never want to leave a stub because the stub can start to decay and that <coughs> decay may eventually go back into the tree. Um, what I see there is I see three side branches or lateral branches. Two of them look pretty sturdy, so I think it's probably too late to try to bend one of those up and have it take over as a central leader. There's one there that appears to be more sucker-like, which would be flexible and limber, and you could try to bend that up and kind of support it with a dowel or something such as that, nylon uh, wrap around it so it doesn't rub too much. And it may take over and eventually become a central leader and a nice trunk for that, but it is a sucker, which means it's uh, also weakly attached. So there may be issues down the road. Um, you can give it a try um, or start over. you can start over. All right, it is the week of Arbor Day. <laughs> well, you know, people love fresh fruit right off their own trees. Growing your own here in Nebraska does take a careful eye and sharp tools to get the job done right. There's some key tips we'd like to share with you for our second feature. There's nothing like the taste of a fresh peach in the summer. And the best way to get that juice is to grow your own. You may have been fortunate to inherit old peach trees, and by old, I mean only about 10 years old. Master Gardener George Edgar is sharing his orchard with us today, and we're gonna talk about how you prune peaches to be able to get that fruit to produce properly. You'll notice that these are very old trees for peaches, and again, that's only about 10 years old. The first scaffold branches are about 24 inches off the ground, and then the interior of the plant is opened up. That would have happened when the plant was young, and then what a person needs to do is keep the interior cleaned out, do some heading cuts, do some lateral branch removal, make sure that you leave enough new wood to be able to allow those trees to produce fruit, and by new wood, what I really mean is the bright red or the bright orange twigs, which are, which are actually where the fruiting spurs occur. What you want to be able to do at this point with this old peach is take out the, the center branch of the scaffold that really is kind of toward the interior, remove some of the shoots that are pointing up, remove anything crossing, and remove anything dead and damaged. So. You do need to pay attention to peach trees every single year if you're going to be doing, getting that great crop. And if you look at a brand new tree, what a homeowner will do is they're either gonna get one that's bare root or they will get one that has already been potted up in the nursery and is a year old or more. Those are handled a little bit differently in terms of pruning. Again, one of the primary rules though is to make sure that the first scaffold branches are at 24 inches above the ground in the first year, all of the side branches get cut back to a stub, so it looks kind of like a feather tree. And then in June of that first season, you take the top out. The reason for doing that, again, is to be able to produce those scaffold branches. No more than about four of them, evenly spaced, the interior of the plant totally opened up. And then after that, what you do is you go in and make those heading cuts, which are at the end of a branch beyond a bud, that reduces the, the, the size of those branches, forces that plant to produce good fruit. You take lateral branches off of the trunk if necessary. And remember that one of the things about a peach tree is they fruit so heavily that 10% of the fruit crop is considered a really heavy load. So enjoy those peaches, go out and buy those trees and know that you're gonna have to do a lot of pruning and expect them only to live about eight to 10 years. It might seem logical to let a fruit tree like a peach grow naturally and you'll be just fine. But understanding how good pruning from the time you plant it until the time it needs to be roved out makes all the difference in the world when it comes to a good harvest every single year. Okay, Tom, you get the next picture. This is a huge yellow twig dogwood. They cut out the center stem and then they've got this bizarre sort of exudate. 
and they're wondering whether that is insect damage or what in the world is that? Uh, I took a close look. I saw no insect damage. I'm just guessing that after the cut, this stuff just gooed out of it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I guess that's a scientific word. Yes. Not a thing you can do about it. Okay, Rock, this is an Alma viewer. Mm -hmm. uh, they have photos of a weed in and around the edges of the bluegrass. Uh, moved in last spring. They've done two rounds of 2,4-D. What is it and what are the chemicals? Um, it's a night nightshade. It's one of the nightshades. I'm not sure which one at that stage. Um, it is uh, really aggressively growing. I'm sure it had to blow in from somewhere. The lawn itself is really thin, so I'm going to you know, throw some fertilizer on that lawn and, and aggressively start mowing it to thicken it up and keep the tops of those uh, nightshade plants mowed off, and I think we, you'll, you won't have to use any herbicide. All right. Thank you, Rock. Um, okay. Kevin, this is a viewer who has a Montmorency cherry. They just noticed this oddball stuff on the bark. They want to know whether they should be concerned. They have other cherries and other apples. Hmm. Hmm. Um, I don't, not sure what oddball stuff they're referring to kind exactly. Kind of that white stuff, I oh, think. The white, the kind of the white yeah. stuff on the bark. Yeah. Well, um, gosh, I really, I really don't know what that is, to be honest with you. Our cherries can, um, they, are, they can succumb to a lot of different kinds of canker fungi. So um, if you start seeing uh, those areas of the stem become sunken or discolored, uh, like a brown discoloration or a dark, dark, dark red, then I'd start to be worried. Um, I really don't know what the, what the white stuff is, to be honest with so you. So maybe she could send us some pictures that are a little closer. Maybe a little bit better pictures yeah. or, even, or even a sample if she can spare it. Okay. All good. right, Kelly, speaking of grape hyacinths, this is a viewer yeah. who bought a house and they're trying to figure out what's coming up. They saw this and they think it spreads and they want to know, is this a keeper or an off with its head? I think it's a keeper. <laughs> uh, it's grape hyacinth um, and I just <clears throat> talked about it uh, as the plan of the week and you know, they might spread a little bit, but they spread nicely. That's a pretty stressful growing location. So I don't think it's, it's not going to become a problem. Enjoy it. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. All right, so as our viewers are beginning to know, we put up a Twitter question every single week, and this week it is, can we use water from our rain barrels to water our vegetable gardens? So if you think you know the answer, you can tweet us back at BYFUNL next week on the show. Uh, we will let our panelists also answer and see whether or not you agree with them. So that's, that's kind of been a lot of fun for us to do the Twitter question. And I believe we have maybe an announcement or two, maybe just one tonight, which is the UNL Hort Club has its spring plant sale, April 23rd to 25th, by the West Teaching Greenhouse, which is actually pretty darn close to the Backyard Farmer Garden. So you can walk through the garden and you can go buy some plants and hope it doesn't freeze when you put them in the ground, which is a real possibility right now. <laughs> Okay, so you get a question, Tom. This is an Omaha viewer that has, um, they have a, a population of mining bees that dig their nests mm -hmm. among, uh, among chrysanthemums. Okay. And uh, they get some wild buckwheat sprouts in the mums. They want to, mums, they want to use a pre-emerge, but they don't want to hurt the bees. And they're wondering, does a pre-emerge and hurt bees? Uh, that's a total guess on my part, but no. Um, if you're really concerned, uh, yeah. pick them out by hand. But but there's there's all kinds of wild bees living out there, and most of them dwell in the ground, so they're actually beneficial to have. Okay, they'd have to have a root <laughs> to, to damage. So I'm not thinking that's going to be much of a problem with the you, bees. You plant people, do your thing. <laughs> We're good. I got the bee side. Okay, uh, okay. So a papillion viewer has creeping Charlie, 50% shaded. He's used borax for a couple of seasons and he's weakened the plant. Uh, leaves are much closer to brown than green, but he wants to know whether he should continue this direction and then is there a shade tolerant turf once he gets rid of creeper? Okay, so so a number of years ago, the, the, the viewer must have heard this from a long time ago, plus Iowa State had a recommendation on borax, 20 mule team borax, I was a rate and all that other stuff. And then they found out after about seven or eight some, uh, <coughs> sequential years of treating it that nothing would grow there and it would be boron toxic. So we said no after a couple of years and we no longer recommend that. And it does knock it back a little bit. Creeping Charlie, um, 
or ground ivy is extremely difficult to control. It's gonna require real aggressive herbicide applications or when you get up into that shaded environment, mulch and planting other species other than a, than a turf plant like we said earlier in the show. So um, if you've got that dense of shade and the Creeping Charlie is really dominating because it's an extremely shade tolerant species, then maybe perhaps you ought to think about planting something that's a horticulturally based plant that's not turf that also has extreme shade tolerance as well. So no matter what he wants for turf, um, there is nothing that's going to be shade tolerant. When to you see probably. Creeping Charlie dominant like that, Kim, it's, it's in, in, and it's in a shady situation, you're never going to gain ground. Never. Okay. All right. Well, maybe not, like, not not never, but it would be a long time. And and, and put the borax in the washing machine, perhaps, as yeah, opposed you, he, to on the put lawn. Put it somewhere else, but no, it, it, we thought it was a great idea, and it worked, but on, Dave Weissong even tried it and said it worked, for those of you that remember Dave, and um, then we quit recommending it because it killed stuff. Okay. <laughs> Including people, pets, insects. And, <laughs> Nobody, and the no, 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 just after. plants. <laughs> all right. Well, unfortunately, that is all the time we have for Backyard Farmer. We want to say thanks to our panel for another great show and to everybody who submitted questions and pictures. Next time on Backyard Farmer, we'll hear from Bill Kreuzer about renovating your turf grass. Bill is starting a project in his own yard and we'll see the first installment about getting started for a better lawn. We'll also feature a home setup with an aquaponic growing system. So good night, good gardening. We'll see you all next week right here on Backyard Farmer. <laughs>